Smoking was also huge. <clears throat> so, toothpaste, all right, let's sell some toothpaste. Let's hit women with this feeling of, I'll, I'm gonna die alone if I have smoke-stained teeth. And he did it. And we still use toothpaste. So, all right, examples of classical conditioning. So cologne or perfume of a loved one who always wears that smell, who you've been close with, how would it affect you when you smell that fragrance again? The example basically is this. After repeated pairings, the initially neutral stimulus, the particular cologne scent, can become a conditioned stimulus. Now, the scent of the cologne evokes feelings of romantic excitement or mild sexual arousal, even in the absence of your lover, or in some cases, long after the relationship has ended. Um, this reminds me of what the, the smell on males in high school from 1998 to 2002 was this smell right here. Old Spice, pure sport. Okay? And I bet that if you dated somebody from that error, right, and it was bad, or maybe it was good, whatever it was, if you smell that later on in life, you are instantly brought back to, oh my gosh, what's going on here? Um, making coffee in the morning, how would it affect you when you begin to smell the coffee? Now, this happens to me. You may have noticed that you begin to feel more awake and alert just after a few groggy sips of your first cup of coffee in the morning. However, it takes at least 20 minutes for the caffeine from the coffee to reach significant levels in your bloodstream. If you're feeling more awake before blood levels of caffeine rise, it's probably because you've developed a classically conditioned response to the sight, smell, and taste of coffee. Conditioned drug effects seem to involve at least some instances of the placebo response, and we already know what that is. A placebo response is an individual psychological and physiological response to what is actually a fake treatment or drug, also called the placebo effect. Uh, contemporary views of classical conditioning. <clears throat> so we'll look at the cognitive aspects, and this, when I say cognitive, it's always going to mental processes. So, according to the cognitive prospect, or prospect, cognitive perspective, mental processes as well as external events are important components in the learning of new behaviors. It is possible that Pavlov's dogs were learning more than the mere, or is it possible that Pavlov's dogs were learning more than the mere association of two stimuli that occurred very closely together in time? To answer that question, let's begin with an analogy. Suppose that you're on your way to school and you have to go through a railroad crossing. Every time a train approaches the crossing, warning lights flash, being rather intelligent for your species. After a few weeks, you conclude that the flashing lights will quickly be followed by a freight train barreling down the railroad tracks. You've learned an association between the flashing lights and, on, and an oncoming train because the lights are a reliable signal. If they were unreliable, you wouldn't learn. But if it's reliable, you would. So the unreliable signal, you never know because maybe whenever the lights flash, sometimes the train doesn't come, and then it becomes unreliable, and you don't learn it. So the signal has to be reliable. This guy came up with this right here. Robert A. Rascorla. <clears throat> so a psychologist that classically conditioned rats, um, testing the reliability of signals. So in 1968, he took one group of rats, uh, and they heard a tone that was paired 20 times with a brief electric shock. A second group of rats experienced the same number of tone shock pairings, but this group also experienced an additional 20 shocks with no tone. Then Rascorla tested for the conditioned fear response by presenting the tone alone to each uh, group of rats. According to the traditional classical conditioning model, both groups of rats should have displayed the same level of conditioned fear. After all, each group had received 20 tone shock pairings. However, this is not what Rascorla found. The rats in the first group displayed a much stronger fear response to the tone than did the rats of the second group. For learning to occur, the conditioned stimulus must be a reliable signal that, predict, that predicts the presentations of the unconditioned stimulus. Rascorla says this 
It is not a stupid process by which the organism willy-nilly forms associations between any two stimuli that happen to co-occur. Your brain's smarter than that. Okay? It's going to infer massive amounts of information without you knowing. Rather, his research suggests that the animal behaves like a scientist, detecting causal relations among events and using a range of information about those events to make the relevant inferences. It has to be reliable. The signal has to be reliable for learning to occur. Now we have taste aversion. So can you learn after one time? Yeah, you can. Uh, so taste aversion is a classically conditioned dislike for any avoidance of a particular food that develops when an organism becomes ill after eating the food. This is also called one trial learning, OTL. So this could be a one-time deal, defying regular rules of classical conditioning. So Taco Bell, I had it, got food poisoning, and then you stay away for years. Does that happen to anybody? Of course it has. You eat something, you get sick, and you stay away from it. The funny thing is, sometimes you eat something, it doesn't make you sick, but you are sick already, and you would possibly vomit that food up, that does it for you right there. You'll stay away from it forever. The food didn't make you sick, you just pair two things together really quickly in a really intense way. <clears throat> so John Garcia is a psychologist who found that taste aversion could be produced in lab rats under controlled circumstances. He found that the particular condition stimulus that is used does make a difference in classical condition. So, um, all right, uh, evolutionary aspects of classical conditioning, biological preparedness. So in learning theory, the idea that an organism is innately predisposed to form associations between certain stimuli and responses. When this concept is applied to taste aversions, rats and people seem to be biologically prepared to associate an illness with a taste rather than a location, a person, or an object. Do you know why we don't like bitter things? Because our ancestors died when they ate bitter things. Poison is bitter, okay? We are biologically prepared to gag or have a gag reflex whenever we have bitter things enter our tasting zone. And guess where all of those bitter taste buds are? In the front? No. They're on the back of your tongue and in your throat to make sure you don't swallow them. So Martin Seligman, 1971, a psychologist noticed that phobias seem to be quite selective. Extreme irrational fears of snakes, spiders, heights, small and close places are relatively common. Why? Because they all killed our ancestors. But very few people have phobias of stairs, ladders, electrical outlets, or appliances, or sharp objects, or even these things, or even though these things are far more likely to be associated with accidents or traumatic experiences. If there was a snake in this room right now, I would be scared to death, specifically if it was poisonous. But I drove to school this morning in a car, which causes far more deaths than snakes. So I am biologically prepared to be a little bit more scared of certain things than other things. Again, we're living in a modern world with ancient hardware. <clears throat> so, Seligman proposed that humans are biologically prepared to develop fears of objects or situations such as snakes, spiders, and heights that may once have posed a threat to humans' evolutionary ancestors. 